Ooh. You can please, please, please whisper, please. Ooh. Thanks, Naharka. Oh. It's really good to see you guys. Thanks for coming on Friday when you normally don't. Um, <laughs> like I've I've been actually really enjoying. Uh, well, not not getting to be in an empty room, but I think it's been pretty cool to hear stories of people um, having these moments in like an empty. Um, in like there, I, I, someone was telling me, oh yeah, I was doing laundry and listening to you preach and like I have to stop folding clothes. Just be like, yeah, amen. I'm like, you, you shout down the screen, man. Like go for it. I think that's so cool. Um, so, but it's, it's really, really cool that you would take the time to be here. I'm just going to look at you for a second to see who's here and just say thank you. Oh, um, awesome. You, uh, uh, Jacob, would you mind? You can put, pull that music. I, I will lose myself if that plays any longer, but I'm very thankful for it. Thank you for what you do. Thank you for the, the tech team who has to deal with me. Um, I came to Northwest University 10 years ago. Oh, uh, I want to show you a picture of my first day at Northwest. Um, I'm wearing this yellow shirt. Yes, there it is. Yeah, just take that in and it's glory. Um, yes, we were doing the little like eagle birdie thing too. That was before Larissa here, so OG right there. Like we, we did the little. Um, but uh, I came to Northwest 10 years ago. Um, and that's me, but that's not me anymore. And I um, was thinking about you, and um, I, I'm going to keep telling you. If I could tell you one thing, I have like 12 one things to tell you. Um, but if I could tell you one thing, I would tell you um, that's not me anymore. And who you are right now is not who you will be. You are becoming who you are. And if you would participate in the process and join Jesus in his like really, really cool, beautiful work, uh, that's going to be your story and your life. I think you'll be pleasantly surprised with where you end up. Um, I've been thinking about God as like an artist. Um, I like music and uh, I also like art, artwork. Even as I was packing up my house last night, my dad was over and I was like, hey, can you pull all these paintings down and you're going to take care of them? But I was thinking about um, God. He's just such a fabulous artist, right? And, like, the cool thing about God as an artist is that God, he takes, like, all of these paints and colors. I, I don't subscribe to saying everything is God. I have uh, sisters and brothers who um, are faithful to Jesus who think differently. I don't think everything in life is always God's, uh, always because of God. Sometimes it's because of your friend who's just makes a dumb choice. Sometimes it's because of you because you make a dumb choice. Um, and you have to reap the, the benefits of it. Sometimes it's, and then a lot of times it's also God. But what I appreciate and what I've come to find out is that God like takes all the pieces of our life and all the paints and all the colors and textures. And like somehow he has this ability to like work them all together. And um, my life really is a story of that. So I want to share with you maybe a few stories um, of how God has painted my life or how God has like brought different pieces of my life together. I, um, Oh, man, what do I want to tell you? I, I could tell you uh, <laughs> about um, coming to Northwest, and uh, I wasn't who I was. Um, and I, I remember coming to Northwest my senior year of high school. Me and my dad got in this fight, and I remember we were, like, yelling at each other outside of a Denny's parking lot at, like, 3 a.m. And um, that was the night that, like, in my heart, I just was kind of like, uh, I'm emotionally done. Like, I, I'm, I'm like, you know, so when he called me when I came to college, and he'd call, I wouldn't always answer, things like that. And uh, I remember years later, I was sitting in this chapel, and it looked different, of course, and I was sitting right around here. And I remember um, in the middle of the chapel, there it was, I don't know if it was a speaker or it was just Jesus, but it just felt like God said, like, Christian, you haven't forgiven. And I was like, yeah, I have. And then come to find out, no, I hadn't. And um, anyone else, is God, God talks to me pretty sarcastically, but that's just kind of how I am. Is anybody else kind of like, God's just, okay, maybe I'll be polite. God, God's blunt with you. But I was like, mm -mm, boy, you have not. And so... Um, I remember, though, years later, I was out traveling with my band. I think I have a picture of them. We're in a forest in this picture. Um, it's actually a photo shoot for our first project together. But, um, yeah, because we were millennials being moody. And so, um, <laughs> hey! So, um, like, so the opposite of any of our personalities at this point. Um, but... But, you know, um, so I remember, though, we were there, and um, I remember years later, Alex is here, he's, we, we've got to travel together, and I remember we were in Oregon years later, and at that, at that beach camp, remember, and there was like, yeah, anyway, and um, I remember being so mad at the band one night, like our first night there, I was just so mad, and I just felt hurt and whatever, and I just like yelled, I'm pretty sure I swore at everybody, um, as a good Christian would, and, um, and, and I remember storming off to my room and like taking a shower, and like the room was steaming up because. I love like when it's warm and so I'm like steaming up and I remember being in there and like praying and just going like God I'm tired of like having close relationships with people and then feeling hurt 
and like being wounded or hurt or being vulnerable and it, and it costing me. I'm tired of like people walking out. I'm tired of feeling like I did nothing wrong and like or caring for people and it costs me. Ever asked that or felt that? And I remember you know, just going like, God, how do I do, like how do I have good relationships with people and not get hurt in the process? And I felt so clearly like God just was like, Christian, you can't which sucked. <laughs> and he's like, but Christian, in order to be, have a relationship with people, in order to be lovable, you have to be woundable. You have to be vulnerable. You have to be breakable because it's in that place that you can only find yourself to be actually lovable. And it was like, Jesus was like, but what have I not done for you? Have I not stayed in the moments that you've broken my heart and the moments that you wounded and the moments you've, heart, you've, you've, you've wronged me? And it actually started to break my heart because I, I realized that, wow, like God has been so, so kind to me. And it reshaped the way, uh, years later, I can say like me and my dad have such a good relationship and like I had to deal with my own narcissism and problems and, and <laughs> real. And, um, but years later, I can just say like God's been so kind in my life and he's brought so much healing. I remember, um, oh man, I remember being a sophomore at, at Northwest and I was a part of Coralons. I think we have a picture of that. And I remember um, singing in Coralons this song called Waymaker. And it was this like Eddie James song. Like, should I, wrote, yeah, Eddie James. Like, we're going there. It is like, you ran the aisle singing this song. It's like, Jesus made a way with no one, no way. And we're just like trying to get hype and it's great. And I like, people would like basically like sangre and just like running down the aisles. And, um, and I, I just remember like singing this song about God making a way where there was no way. And we were on our way to a church in Vancouver, and um, there was this church, and I remember there was a Costco right by the church, and we were pulling through, and it was raining really hard, and I was feeling really sick. Now, like, when I get sick, I'm a punk. Like, I'm, when I'm sick, I'm like, someone wait on me hand and foot, but don't talk to me. Like, I just, I'm like, I don't want you near me, but you better take care of me. Uh, like, I'm just, I'm a mess. So I just remember being, like, frustrated, and I was kind of pouty, and I was in the, the Coralons bus, and my head was on the window, and it was raining, and it felt like a 2001 Usher music video. And... <laughs> I remember, um, remember sitting there and just being like, oh, God, I don't want to sing this song. I don't want to be here. And it was like one of those moments where like, Jesus was so kind to me. And he's just like, Christian, what have I done for you? And is anyone else like when God asks you something like that, you're like, oh, you saved me and you care for me and I'm adopted. And uh, like, does anybody else, you like, you just know the right answer. So you say it. And it felt like God was like, but Christian, what else? And I was like, I don't know what you mean. And I don't know about your prayer life, but like for me, prayer isn't always just like on my knees in the closet, like doing my thing. Often prayer is just me thinking with God. And um, I remember that night uh, getting ready for this concert that I didn't want to sing a song about God being a waymaker. And I remember him going, Christian, what have I done for you? And I gave him all the right answers and it was still not it. And he goes, Christian, that's what I've done for you, but what am I going to do? And it was the first time in my life that I felt like I ever had to think about the second half of the story, actually the last half of the story, where you realize that the end of the story is not the cross and just the forgiveness of sins. It's an empty tomb. It's the resurrection of the body. And even goes beyond that, it's actually the fact that Jesus is going to return. And actually, like, what that night did for me in that tour bus, I realized that my hope isn't in just, like, the cross and my problems being fixed and being justified and forgiven. My hope is actually that Jesus is coming again and that he's actually going to, like, fix the world. Uh, that's something we need right now. <laughs> like, we have a God who sees the problems and, like, sees the hurt and the pain. And he's not just like, oh, one day I'm going to... Like, think about it. If our hope is just heaven flying away in this ethereal, disembodied state, then, like, Jesus didn't really win. Bodies are broken. They just die, and we just float away. Cities are destroyed. Injustice in the world. And you're telling me the hope of the world is that one day you'll float and walk on streets of gold? That's not hope. That's escape. Jesus offers something so much better. He actually says one day he's going to come. He's going to fix the world. He's going to wipe every tear. He's going to rule with justice and peace for all people, all nations. That deserves an amen. And, amen. and he's going to fix the world. And maybe, maybe some of you haven't gone through enough like hell um, to, to understand how meaningful that is. I know some of your stories. And I know some of you have gone through tragedy. But like, I, I mean, I think of my mother who was born in this village in Ethiopia and um, her story was on national news once, so I can, I can share it. And, um, but she, um, long story short, was dropped in a fire as a child and um, she, now she has prosthetic legs. And I think about my hope as a Christian for the longest time was that one day I'd be in heaven with my mom forever. But I realized all of a sudden that my hope is that Jesus is gonna resurrect the body and he's gonna fix it. And I'll get to like ride a bike with my mom. 
I'll get to do that. Don't you see how like more hopeful and beautiful the Christian story is? Like the gospel of Jesus Christ is so much more beautiful than escape. It's resurrection and it's restoration and it's good. And it's the actual hope that our world really needs and longs for. I learned that by sitting in a Coralon's bus my sophomore year, pouting about singing a song that God would be my way maker. I um, could tell you a story about uh, making a really poor choice and um, being sitting in Phil's office talking to him about it and processing it. And um, I could tell you like feeling so horrible and also feeling so loved at the same time. And Hannah, um, I, I, you mentioned wherever you are, um, you know, that you, know, you, know, you felt loved when someone saw you in your worst. And I, I experienced that myself with, with Phil and Brenda. And I, I can tell you um, one thing I learned out of that situation is that I'm like so much more, I'm so much worse than I like could imagine. <laughs> like I'm capable of doing way worse things than I ever thought. And friends, you are too. And what that does though, when you realize like, I don't even know how bad I could be, but God. <laughs> but what it does for you is it actually gives you a real humility. Because then all of a sudden when people hurt me, when people wrong me, when people fail, when people do just horrible things, I realize, but by the grace of God, I would do the same thing. And it's like shaped my heart to have people who see me at my worst and love me. And Jesus has done that for me. It's changed my life. I could um, tell you, oh man, I could tell you about uh, my last day in my pastoral care and counseling class with this professor named Chuck Kimmin. He is a vet and a great guy, pastoral um, counselor. He's incredible. He's done therapy for me in my own personal life, and it's been great. And I could tell you about my last day of class where the night before, Washington State did legislation on, like, some pretty crazy stuff. Um, and, like, he was really nervous about the ramifications of that over the long haul of our, our, our state. And so we have a final this last day of class. And so we're all sitting in the class for, like... 15 minutes, and you know, like, the unspoken rule, like, if a prop doesn't show up in, like, 15 minutes, we out. So I was, like, ready to get out the door, and it was our final. I was like, yo, I need this grade, dog, but, like, where are you at? So he, no lie, he, like, comes storming and pushes the door. He goes, by God! Like, those are the first words out of his mouth. I'll never forget it. By God! Well, class, and he, like, no lie, starts a monologue, and he always holds his hands behind his back. And he was like, well, class, I've taught you a lot of things this semester, and we've talked a lot about pastoral care and counseling and my years of experience in this field and things that you've learned and wrestled with, but... After all these lessons we've taught and all these things we've shared, I've got to be honest, um, I'm just glad that I'm close to retiring and that I don't have to deal with the mess that's going to happen in your state because of what we just voted on. And he goes, uh, I'm glad I'm not going to be you. <laughs> and uh, what you're going to need after everything we talked about in class, as useful as it is, you're just going to need the spirit of God to guide you. Let me pray for you. This man like prays for us and like hands us our final and like walks, exit stage left. He just like left the building. But like as funny and like partially traumatic as that is, um, as that is, it actually was so true though. For the world we're living in, the world needs, they need God. Like, we need the spirit of God. You are getting an education, but I hope that what you're really getting is close to Jesus. And that when you leave this place, that you would walk so close to Jesus, so close to his heart, that people would, like, get around you and feel his presence. And that they would actually experience the life of God coming near to them. Do you realize, like, oh, man, I'm going on a tangent, but it's my last day. Here we go. Do you realize that, like, what eternal life actually is? I always thought that eternal life was just about heaven. Like, and by that, I mean, like, going to heaven when you die. But when you read Jesus... So many times he doesn't really say that. Like, tell me one time where Jesus says you get to go to heaven when you die. I'm not saying we're not going to heaven. Just don't freak out. I'm just saying, like, what he actually talks about is eternal life being about life of the age to come. And what he's saying is that eternal life is the, not just temporal, not just time, not just living forever, but a quality of life that can start here and now and go forever. The quality of life with God. The kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God is just about what life is like when God's in charge. And what Jesus is inviting you and I to when he invites you into eternal life is actually to live life in partnership next to God, with God, and experience how good life is when God is in charge. And that starts here and now. And what we do when we die, we just just wake back up in his presence and that continues on forever and then he comes and restores the world and it keeps on going eternal life is so much better than heaven when you die it's so much better than escape it's actually available here and now it's life with God and that's why Jesus can get on in John 17 look at his disciples and he could say this is eternal life that you would know the father and Jesus Christ whom he sent eternal life is so much better than you think it is it's knowing God it's having closeness with him it's incredible I, um, I keep this painting, I've kept this painting, it's leaving, but I've kept this painting in my office for the last 
um, years at Northwest. It was made, painted by a student um, during our Easter, one of our first Easter pursuits. And um, it's beautiful. I love this thing. And it's this painting we, um, I was being all arts. He's like, hey, can we have you paint some painting during worship? And when you paint it, we'll sing multiple songs and it could be multiple paintings and, you know, artsy people. Um, and so I remember, so she painted, first of all, this nail. I don't know if you can see it, but the canvas was blank and it was just a nail. And it was this, this nail. And, I, and as I look at it, I think about like how all of our lives are a story and all of our lives are like a painting that God is partnering with us to paint and partnering with us. And sometimes like that story has nails in it and it has wounds in it. Yet Jesus really gets those. And he knows what it's like to be wounded. And your story, though it has wounds, it's not wounds that, like are go, that go unseen or even unidentified with. But then this painting, she decided to like turn this thing and now you'll see kind of this hill and this round figure. And she started to paint this hill that's later uh, Calvary. And I just think about how um, there will be hilltops in life and mountaintops in life. Abraham went to this same mountaintop. There'll be hills and mountains in your life that... Um, you know, the hilltop should be good, but deaths will happen on the hills. And there'll be moments when um, things will fall apart in your life and things will die and things will not go as expected. And um, Jesus, first of all, gets it and he's there. He knows what it's like to experience death. What's so interesting about the Christian message and why I think the gospel is so good and powerful is not that because God stops death. It's interesting right, right now, at least. I mean, thank God he's getting rid of death. But, like, he doesn't always save us from every death. He doesn't always stop it from every pain and every suffering. And, you know, you would think that, like, if we had a God who stops every form of suffering, we would know he's powerful. But we wouldn't really know that he's loving. And what we find in Jesus is a God who doesn't always stop suffering but enters into it. And proves his power by bringing resurrection out of it. And what I could tell you about the painting that will be your life and your story, both here in Northwest and for the rest of your days, is that there will be deaths in it. There will be nails in it. There will be wounds in it. But you have a God of resurrection. And a God who actually shows both his power and his love by bringing dead things back to life. And if you would learn basically to do this one thing, shocking what I'm about to say, would you trust the story? Would you trust the story? Would you trust that Jesus gets it, that he sees the wounds, that he understands it, but that he doesn't let the story end there? Would you trust that he's not going to leave you wanting, that he's not going to leave you hurting, that he's not going to leave you at the end of your life going disappointed? Now, don't get me wrong. Disappointments will come. Things will turn out differently than you, than you expect. But I promise you, as you follow Jesus, you will find yourself so deeply satisfied, so deeply full. I think all of our life's problems come down to this one simple word, and it's trust. Like, every issue in your life comes down to simply, do I trust that God is good? Do I trust that God will take care of me? Do I trust that God sees the hurt? Do I trust that God will see the pain? Do I trust that God gets it and that he doesn't just get it, but he's active and alive and powerful and he's moving? All of your life's problems come down to this one place of trust. And if you and I would become people who learn to open-handedly go, Jesus, I don't understand it, I don't see it, but I can trust you with it. I can trust you with it. That's faith. Faith is just the simple act of trusting. You can trust him with the painting that is your life. You can trust him with the different textures and colors. You can trust him. You can trust him with it. I want to end by... Um, reading a scripture over you, but one thing I say all the time at Northwest, um, students, if you've been here before for a while, anytime we do an event, anytime we do a gathering, anytime we put on anything, our goal has always been simply this, not to say oh, that's a good speaker or that's a good worship leader or that's a good event or that's a good pastor. Our goal every time we do anything together at this place is to say, wow, that's a good God. He'll write your story. And I promise you at the end of it, if you just pay attention to the way he weaved things and painted things, I promise you, you'll be able to say, wow, he's been a really good God. Surprising. <laughs> Plot twists, left and right. Surprising, but faithful. Trustworthy. True. He's good. And my hope for you, my greatest hope for this community, is that we would be people who would love Jesus so deeply. That you would find yourself loving him more and more deeply. That like your life would be one that trusts him, that loves him, and that follows him. 
I'd like to read uh, Ephesians chapter 2 over you just as a uh, prayer and a benediction. So would you do this? Um, Would you just open your hands right in front of you, whether you're watching or in the room? And that's just a way of like, it's nothing extra spiritual. It's just we we talk with our mouths. Sometimes we can can pray with our bodies too. So you're just putting your hands in front of you just as a way of praying with your body and just receiving. I want you to hear the words of scripture and trust them. It says, but God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love that he had for us, he made us alive with Christ. Even though we were dead in our trespasses, you are saved by grace. He also raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavens in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages, he might display the immeasurable riches of his grace through his kindness in Christ Jesus. You're saved by grace through faith. It's not from yourselves. It's God's gift, not of works, not from works, so that no one can boast. For we are his workmanship. You're created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. So Northwest University, my sisters and brothers, let me pray for you. Jesus, you have been very faithful to me. And I know because of that that you'll be faithful to my sisters and brothers here too. Would you show yourself faithful with all their stories and all the pain and all the mess and all the confusion and all the joys, would you show yourself faithful? God, I I pray for my... uh, family here who really struggles with mental health. God, would you meet them here? Would you help them? Would you bring them to the right people to get help? But would they find that they're not alone and that there's healing and there's help and there's life available? I pray for my sisters and brothers of color. God, would you help Northwest become more and more of a home for them? God, I thank you for uh, people who are far from you here. Would you do what you do and show up in their lives and would they come to love you and know you the way that I have? That you're faithful and you're close and you see it and you don't ignore it and you care. Would people who don't know you come to know you here? God, I ask that Northwest would be a place that's deep, that has really deep trust. Would people walk away from Northwest loving you and trusting you more than they ever have before? Would they see that you're good? which you always have been, you always will be. Would you be faithful to them? Would you show yourself true and trustworthy? Thank you for that. And so Northwest University, may you be good hearers of the word and better doers. May you love Jesus deeply. May you trust what Jesus says. And may you follow Jesus well. God bless you.